All right, uh, let's start the, the third talk. And the third talk is going to be again about concentration inequalities. So, uh, especially during the first talk, what we are focusing on were some of the independent random, uh, independent random variables. And what we said that is that if all of this xi are nice, let's say that they have bounded moments or sub-Gaussians or whatnot, and they are independent, we said they're completely independent, then this sum is extremely well concentrated around its expectation. So in this talk, we will be uh, looking at a uh, more general phenomenon. Let's say that we have some arbitrary complicated function f, and we want to, and uh, like f is a, a function that takes n variables and spits out a real number. And we want to say that if we apply this f to a bunch of nice independent random variables, then in fact, this f of x1 to xn is, is uh, extremely well concentrated around its expectation. So uh, we are looking at the sums of uh, random variables, independent random variables anymore. We are looking at some more complicated uh, functions. And it seems like things are going to be much more like, it seems that you shouldn't hope to get a very general results of this form. And uh, to me, it is quite surprising how, for how general classes of functions, you, we will be able to show extremely strong con concentration around the expectation. What's even more surprising is that often, actually calculating this expectation is a very difficult task. So we have some complicated function f. Understanding what is the expectation of this f when applied to random variables might be an extremely difficult task. Nevertheless, we will be able to just apply not too fancy, well, relatively fancy, but we'll be able to just apply some general theorems. We'll be able to look at this function f and see that it has a bunch of nice properties. And we will be able to deduce that whatever the expectation of f is, <coughs> the value of this function is extremely uh, closely con concentrated around its expect expectation, even though calculating the expectation might be difficult. So what kind of functions are not, uh, let me actually try to, OK, that's not working much. Uh, yeah, I was told that the, I, I'm being too loud with this microphone. Uh, anyway, so for what kind of functions we shouldn't hope to get uh, the good concentration? Let's imagine that I have a function f that you know, look, takes a, an, an independent random variables and spits out the first one. This function is very simple, but we shouldn't expect that this function is concentrated around its expectation any better than, like, so w w what this whole uh, concentration of measure phenomenon is, is that we hope to get much better concentrations for the function of independent Gaussians than, uh, of independent random variables than the, the, we, we have had the concentration in the first place. If, F just spits out the first variable, we, we, are, we shouldn't be getting anything interesting. If F is an average of all of those variables, we have shown that you are getting some really cool concentration bands of them. So if, in general, if F depends on one of the, those variables uh, very strongly, so it's extremely well concentrated with one of those variables, we shouldn't hope to have an, uh, nice concentration results. Uh, the same kind of thing by doing is like shows up in the, the central limit theorem, for example. Right? If you have a sum of independent random variables and you know that one of them has variance that's much larger than all of the remaining, you don't see a, a convergence to a Gaussian. What would be an example for which we are hoping to have a concentration? Let's imagine that I have a random matrix with independent plus minus one entries. So this function f, and what I want to look at is the operator norm, spectral norm of this matrix A. So this function f maps the entries, like independent signs, which, are, which I should want to think as entries of a matrix to the spectral norm of a matrix with those entries. So this is like extremely complicated function. And nevertheless, it doesn't depend too strongly on each of those variables, xi. So we will be hoping that whatever is the expectation of the uh, operator norm of a matrix like this, we, we want to show that, there are, that we have 
really good concentration of this, this operator norm around its expectation. And we'll be deducing those kind of inequalities. I, I, I'm going to use this example over and over again. We'll be deducing those kind of inequalities from some fairly general theorems. Uh, yeah. So this, this function that maps all the entries of, of matrix to the, the spectral norm of a matrix with this entries is fairly complicated. It, we, we, there is a lot of going on. It's not as easy as some, but we still hope to show that this, this, this function actually concentrates around its expectation. So by the way, uh, I, I know that my entries of a matrix A are just uh, random signs, plus minus one. So really, it's not obvious a priori what, what is this expectation of the spectral norm? Like, what is this value that I uh, want to look uh, at the concentration around? And in fact, like, if all I know is that my entries are bounded by plus minus one, we could, you know, there is non-zero probability that I will just get a, a matrix that has all one entries. This matrix has a spectral norm n. So a priori, the spectral norm could be anything between zero and n. Uh, in fact, if, we, if, if you want a, a, a nice exercise from the previous lecture, it is not too difficult with this entire net stuff and all, all, this, all this stuff. It is not too difficult to show that this expectation of a norm of a random plus minus one matrix is on the order of square root n. So it is much, much smaller than what it could have possibly been. So the way you prove it is that, that you, you take this net of a sphere, you prove that on this net the, the norm isn't too large, and then you, you, you do the same kind of extension as we did before. I, I really recommend this uh, as, a, as a nice exercise. Uh, anyway, with the techniques that you have already learned, it is possible to prove that, in fact, this expectation is uh, around square root, this expectation of a spectral norm of A, where A has independent plus minus one entries, is on the order of square root N. But to do this, you need to actually use the geometry, you need to construct the nets, then you need to, you need to use linearity of the like, convexity of the norm, you need to use a bunch of stuff. Like, you basically repeat the argument we've had for the subspace embedding with minor differences. Uh, what we will show is that actually the, no, the spectral norm of a matrix A is extremely well concentrated around its expect, expectation in a sense that we will see, devi even though the expectation is as large as square root n, the deviations are on the order basically constant. So it is, so it is, uh, it has sub-Gaussian distribution with the sub-Gaussian parameter that's constant. Uh, yeah, so like with standard deviation is constant, and then the probability that I'm, you know, that my spectral norm is larger than 10 than the, the expected spectral norm is exponentially negative 10 squared or something. So this, this drops extremely fast. So the distribution of a spectral norm is just basically a spike on the expectation that's of, of order root n, and the, the width of the spike is is of, of size constant. This is much stronger than you would hope, and we will be able to deduce those kind of things from fairly general theorems. So this is the, the talk of this, the, the goal of this thing. So first thing that, uh, first thing that we can actually show that's even, that's much simpler than, than proving that this is one sub-Gaussian. It is that this uh, spectral norm is concentrated uh, as a Gaussian around the, its mean is just overbounding the variance of the spectral norm. So this is already some sort of uh, concentration inequality, right? Like if, I upper, if I show that this variance, so I know that the expectation is square root n. If I show that the variance is bounded by some constant, then I know that at least with probability 99% by Chebyshev inequality, this is within you know, plus minus constant from the expectation. So this is already pretty cool. And this we will be able to show using relatively innocently looking inequality. And the inequality is called Efron-Stein. 
It says that if I want to upper bound a variance of my function f applied to those independent random variables, uh, I can upper bound it by, let, let's just draw a random point x and sum over all the coordinates of variance of f when I redraw an, an i-th coordinate. So I draw a random, random point, point x, x1 to xn. Uh, I fix this value f, and now I just redraw a single coordinate xi, and I look at what is the variance of this, of this, of this, of this random variable. So here I, what I mean is that variance of this condition on x1 to xn, uh, and now I'm uh, averaging over all, all x's. And you can prove this inequality. The way you prove it is you use some sort of, uh, how do you call it, cha 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 chain rule? Right? The, the things that, you know, you can condition on stuff and then you can average things that you have conditioned on, something like this. The proof isn't very enlightening. You just sit down and, and condition and prove. Uh, the point is that you can actually prove this in, you know, 15 or minutes or so. This is not very deep inequality. And this inequality will already tell us something interesting about variance of a spectral norm, norm of a random matrix. So for now, uh, let's, uh, for now I will show a much worse band that this variance is at most n. So the standard deviation of this spectral norm is on the order square root n. This is already non trivial and this is already interesting result and it's, it's going to follow almost directly from this Ephron-Stein inequality. So in general, let's look at the functions f and I'm going to say that f has bounded differences. If whenever I fix all of the coordinates except, of the, except for the one, then, and I vary this one coordinate, then values of my functions don't change by more than ai on the ai coordinate. So this is my definition of a bounded difference function. And now note that if my function has this property, then all like then those variances here are going to be bounded by ai squared. This is just saying that uh, if a random variable is bounded by ai, then its variance is bounded by ai squared. This is not surprising. So whenever I have a bounded difference function, I can look at, I can upper bound the variance of f by sum of squares of ai. Note that, so uh, let's try to apply this to this, this operator norm of matrix A, right? It is not too difficult to say that if, if, I, if my entries, uh, if my xi's are just plus minus one random variables, then whenever I switch a, a single entry of my matrix, the operator norm doesn't change by more than one. This means that my function f that maps the entries of a matrix to the uh, operator norm is actually uh, has this bounded difference property with differences bounded by one. Each of those differences is bounded by one. Uh, Ah, oh, this is terrible. Okay, it didn't prove anything. But this is cool theorem. Sorry, this, there is a mistake on this slide. Uh, so in general, I can, for any function like this, I can up and upper bound the variance of f by the sum of square of differences. Unfortunately, as, as it is, it doesn't say anything interesting for the spectral norm. Because really, I have to sum those things over you know, all the entries of my matrix. I have n square of the entries. So I will see that my variance of the spectral norm is bounded by n square, which would tell me that the standard deviation is bounded by n. This isn't, this isn't saying anything. I know that this whole operator norm is bounded by a. But this is already like a, a cool thing that we might use every now and then. And with only a little bit more work, we will be able to actually show this, this uh, I hope correctly we'll be able to show that this 
variance of the operator norm of a random matrix is actually bounded by, by something of the constant of the, by a slightly more fancy statement of this Effenstein inequality. So let me rephrase it in a way that's going to look very surprising. And when I first saw it, I didn't understand. Like, it doesn't seem to do anything. So uh, again, I'm upper bounding by, uh, the, the variance of f by average over excess of things that look like uh, variances of f of x, f, where I redraw a single coordinate. The only real difference that uh, I did is uh, that in all those terms, I, I care only about the, uh, only about the uh, kind of deviation in, the, in one, one sided deviation. So I look, I look at this uh, f of x1 to xn, I redraw the coordinate, xi prime. If this coordinate, if this value happened to decrease, then I, I'm counting only this. I'm squaring the, I'm squaring, I, I redraw this xi prime, I'm squaring this value, but only if it, it was positive in the first place. Now, if you sit, like, it's not too difficult to just sit down and calculate that this whole thing is basically the same as half of the half of the variance or something. So this is just a weird way of rephrasing the same inequality. But for some logical reason, it, like, just the fact that I'm looking only at this positive deviation is going to make this make using this inequality in uh, some specific cases much much simpler. Okay, so how how do I now bound the variance of a random matrix A? by one using this inequality. Let's draw all of this coordinate uh, x. Let's draw all of them. So I draw, uh, take a random matrix A. And I know that by definition, this spectral norm is supremum over all vectors u, v on the sphere of the, of this quadratic form u transpose a, a, v. So let's just fix those vectors u and v that realize this supremum. What I'm going to be able to say is that if I redraw a single coordinate, I don't know how much the I don't know how much the spectral norm can grow, but I know that it couldn't possibly drop by too much. Why? Let's say that A tilde is um, is the same matrix as A, but I redraw the coordinate uh, ij. So uh, I look at the matrix A plus some random variable alpha that's either zero or two, or, or minus two, times the matrix that has only one non-zero entry at position ij. So my matrix E ij is just a matrix that has zero every one and one on the entry ij. Okay? So now, what can I say about uh, this variable spectral norm of A minus spectral norm of A tilde. It could have possibly, uh, so this might be much larger than the spectral norm of A, but I'm claiming that this is never much smaller. Why? Uh, I know, so by, by the definition, the spectral norm is supremum over U and V of this thingy. So wherever, the, so this supremum, uh, is at least the value on the same vectors for, for, for the matrix A tilde. The supremum is at least as large as the value of this, uh, of this quadratic form on vectors U, V. Maybe I will try to write it down. Uh, so I know that for a matrix A, this is, this is U transpose A, V. And now, for some, for some fixed U and V. And now, now I know that the value of A tilde is at least U transpose A tilde V, right? Because this, this, this spectral norm is supremum over all possible vectors, so it's at least 
a value at a given point, which means that the uh, which means that a minus a tilde is at most whatever it was minus whatever is the value of u transpose v on this matrix a tilde. Uh, so even so, the bottom line is that if I redraw a single coordinate, I don't know whether this spectral norm grown uh, by much, but I can surely say that the spectral norm didn't decrease by more than two times ui vj. Okay, I can just plug, plug this inequality up here. I know that this square of this difference, square of the positive part of this difference is bounded by ui square vi, v, vj square. Uh, and I'm, su I'm summing over all possible i, I and j's because here I was supposed to sum over all possible entries of my matrix. So I'm summing over all possible uh, entries uh, uh, i and j of ui square v, vj square. I knew that vi, ui and v, u and v are unit vectors, so this entire thing is bounded by four. And by everyone's standard inequality, this means that my variance of f is bounded by, by constant. Okay, so uh, so that is pretty cool. Like we we had to use something about what is what is our function a, but we didn't really work that that much, and we managed to prove extremely well uh, at least a concentration on a like really nice scale for the sp uh, spectral norm a, right? Like we. we the spectral norm in expectation is as large as square root n, but we've managed to prove that the variance is so much smaller than the expectation without much work. Uh, okay, so this is a, like uh, one one kind of inequalities that the, one kind of inequality that's really nice to to work with and which shows some sort of, sort of concentration for uh, arbitrary function as soon as you can just bound the the dependencies on each. Uh, on every coordinate separately. Uh, yes? Um, yes. 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 So, uh, yes, yes. So when you are, uh, I told you that you have to prove this inequality. And when you are proving it, you'll be using some sort of uh, like conditioning here and there, and some sort of chain rule, and I think at some point you want to say that something conditioned on something is the same as if you just drop the conditioning. Yes. I mean, uh, I mean, yeah, like uh, clearly, uh, so, Imagine that uh, the, 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 the stupidest example, right? Imagine that f is just sum of xi and xi are, are plus minus one random variables. Then this f Einstein inequality is actually telling uh, us the correct thing that if they are independent, then the variance is of order n. So the standard deviation is of order square root n. But this is not true when they are uh, not independent. But all the xi's are just equal to each other then the sum of xi is just plus n or minus n. So the standard division is as large as n. Uh, okay, so another inequality is one of the like, nicest to work with and extremely strong and uh, one with surprisingly short and tricky proof. So let's say that I have any function that has, uh, ah, no. There's no inequality yet. There's a definition. Uh, I'm going to define a Lipschitz function as a function from Rn to R such that the difference of the values in, is bounded by some constant times the distance between the points. This is a, like, uh, yeah, this is a, a common notion. You probably have seen it. And by the way, this is 
if my function is the differentiable, which I will assume just for the convenience, then this is equivalent to saying that the gradient of my function is bounded by, by the same value L. So uh, one extremely strong inequality is that whenever I have a, a Lipschitz function and I apply it to Gaussian random variables, then this, this, uh, this random variable Independent, independent Gaussian random variables, this is crucial here, of course. Then this uh, new random variable is going to be about L sub, sub Gaussian around its expectation. And the motivating example is, again, a norm of a random matrix. Let's say that I have a random matrix uh, with independent Gaussian entries. Again, it's not too difficult to see that the expectation of this norm is square root n. And, uh, and I claim that just from this general uh, theorem, we can easily deduce that uh, this, this norm of a uh, matrix with Gaussian entries is actually one sub Gaussian around its expectation. Because it's not too difficult to check that this norm is one Lipschitz with, uh, with respect to the, the matrix that we look at. Uh, so that's pretty cool. So this is the kind of theorem that I promised you. That the, if you look at the random matrix with independent entries, then even though the expected spectral norm is quite large, the concentrated around this, uh, concentration around this expectation is extremely, extremely good. OK, uh, so there are same, proof of, same proofs of this theorem. I'm going to show uh, extremely short and magic to proof that uh, I don't really have any idea how to come up with anything like this, but it turns out to work. And so this one, by the way, is going to use the fact that my random variables are actually exactly Gaussian in a very, very strong way. Uh, okay, so I'm going to assume that my function is differentiable, so that the fact that it's Lipschitz is, uh, is just saying that the gradient is bounded the L2 norm of a gradient at any point is bounded by L. And what I want to do is I want to show a concentration of F of Z applied to, to, to a vector of independent Gaussian around its expectation. To show, an, uh, exp to show a concentration is the same as showing a moment bound by what I've told you two to, to, to lectures ago. So all I want to show is the, an upper bound on the moment of F of Z, P moment of F of Z minus the expectation. Now, there's this very standard trick that it's annoying to look at the shifted random variables by the, the constant. Instead of this, what I can do is I can draw two independent copies of my z, and I, look, I can look at the difference between, between f of z and f of z prime. If I prove that for two independent copies of my random variable, the so expectation of this thing is zero. If I prove that this, whole, this thing is bounded, uh, is concentrated around its expectation, then I know that my random variable that I started with was concentrated around the, the, the expectation, around the expectation that it was. So really, what's happening is that I have a Lipschitz function f. I draw two independent random Gaussian vectors z and z prime. I look at the difference between f of z minus f of z prime, and I want to have a moment bound. I want to prove that the p moment of this uh, scalar object is bounded by whatever should be p moment of a Gaussian. So square root p times the, uh, the Lipschitz constant. Uh, that sounds like a difficult task to do. Here is one trick that's still not completely insane. We can uh, take a, we can use a, like, we can write f of z minus f of z prime by fundamental theorem of uh, calculus as some sort of integral. So what's happening here? I have some point z and z prime, they are random. I want to, uh, I want to analyze f of z minus f of z prime. I connect 
those two things by some path. And I'm saying that the, this difference is equal to the integral of the derivative of my function when, when I integrate over this path. So this is just a fundamental theorem of calculus. Uh, and now I can apply the, the chain rule. So what is this derivative uh, of f of whatever is my path with respect to the time parameter theta? By the chain rule, it's equal to the, so in this point, the d f the f of the uh, f of my path of a time parameter is equal to the inner product of a gradient of f so i have some sort of gradient of my function at this point times the velocity of my curve the gamma in the point theta so the velocity is just you know a velocity i look at this inner product and uh, and so by, by the chain rule those those two things are equal now this is this is showing that the first step or by introducing this like integral is not completely stupid because I knew that my gradient f is bounded everywhere by, by a constant. Like at least none of this gradient f is bounded everywhere. Uh, so at least some sort of correct quantity starts showing up in the proof. Uh, okay. So this is just equality. I wanted to bound the norm of P norm of this random variable, I can uh, I can put a P norm on the outside. Like this is equal to the P norm of this integral, but norms are convex. Convex, so I can upper bound a norm of this average by the same integral, but I have a norm inside P norm inside. This is still not too insane. Here is an insane thing. So the kind of, uh, so I chose this curve connecting Z and Z prime in a very uh, specific way. I, I, I decided to connect Z and Z prime with a curve that is like Z times cosinus theta plus Z prime times sine theta. So when I plug in theta equals zero, this is exactly z. When I plug in theta equals p over two, this is exactly z prime. But it actually does matter that I chose this kind of parameterization and this, this kind of uh, arc. Why? Because, so, uh, so I, I like, uh, I'm, I, I did this, uh, you know, this chain rule business and I'm, evaluating gradient f at my, at my point and taking an inner product with the velocity. So this, like this, this velocity is just the over, like, derivative of this over uh, theta, right? Uh, what happens is that you can easily check that those, those, those are Gaussian random variables that are uncorrelated. Because they are Gaussians, so this is like completely insane proof. This, like this, this whole thing, the same, this whole, this whole vectors are uh, orthogonal to each other. Hence, this, this random variable is a, a multivariate Gaussian that's uncorrelated with this random variable. This means that they are actually independent. So when I'm looking at this thing, it doesn't, it, it doesn't really depend on theta at all. This, is, this whole long expression is just the same as if I chose a random Gaussian z, I evaluated gradient here, and I take to the inner product with completely independent random Gaussian z prime. So my direction would be like completely independent z prime. Uh, so this is where I'm using 
the, the Gaussianity assumption in an extremely strong way, and this is like really magical that this velocity happened to be exactly the, the Gaussian distribution that is uh, independent of the point where I'm looking, where I'm looking at. And now, uh, and now the, the, like the, the rest just follows. I, it is very easy to bound this thing, like gradient of f evaluated at the random point in a product with the uh, independent Gaussian z prime. Just because whenever I condition on the z, I know that this is this has the same the exact same distribution as just a Gaussian like, like univariate Gaussian rescaled by the norm of z, but by, by the norm of a gradient. Once you condition on z, this is this is this is some uh, fixed vector. I'm taking an inner product of a fixed vector with a random Gaussian vector. This is just a univariate Gaussian with a, that's rescaled by the norm of this vector. The norm of this vector is always uh, always upper bounded by L. So, when, however I fix z, this LP norm of this inner product is upper bounded by Gaussian with a, uh, by the LP norm of a univariate Gaussian with a scale that's at most, uh, at most the Lipschitz constant, at most the length of the gradient. But the length of the gradient is, is at most the, the Lipschitz constant. So, which is exactly L times square root P. So, for every fixed point theta on my curve, I can upper bound this LP norm by just, by just L times square root P. So, the entire, uh, entire integral is upper bounded by pi over 2, like the length of the scope, times uh, L over square root P. Uh, yes, so this is the entire proof. It wasn't long. It's, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. To me, the fact that those variables end up, end up being uh, independent, Gaussians, is completely magical. But once you are aware of this, that you can pick this clever uh, parameterization, it's not too difficult to reproduce this, this proof by yourself. Uh, yes? Uh, yeah, so this is like, imagine that I just, uh, imagine that I just had two like univariate Gaussians, z is univariate, z1 is n01, and z2 is independent univariate. I want to say that uh, cos theta z1 times cos theta plus z2 sine theta and z1 sine theta minus z2 cos theta, that those two are, again, independent univariate Gaussians. Uh, but to check whether, like, if, if this is, you know, jointly Gaussian, then to check whether they are independent, it's enough to check whether they are uncorrelated. And you can just calculate this correlation. It's basically an inner product. So this correlation is going to be an inner product between the vector uh, is cos theta sine theta, and the vector v2 is negative sine theta, uh, sine theta and negative cos theta. And those vectors happen to be orthogonal to each other. Uh, so, and this happens like on every coordinate, the same thing happens. Like in this case, on every coordinate, the same thing happens, and between coordinates, obviously, there are no, no correlations. There are no dependencies. So, yes, the, the bottom line is that those variables are uh, independent Gaussians just because this vector of coordinates cos theta sine theta is orthogonal to the vector sine theta negative cos theta. Okay. Uh, so we use this, uh, this independence thingy, 
uh, this uh, let, uh, let us prove that at each single point theta, this LP norm is very small. And then we integrated, uh, but we integrated it only over like thing that curve that's of length of pi over two. So this, this whole thing is bounded by L square root P. And this completes the proof. Uh, yeah. Uh, there are other proofs of this. Uh, they require working a little bit more, but I kind of believe that they are more true. I think they, they kind of explain more what's going on uh, in this, in this uh, inequality. Okay, so here is, uh, here is one surprising thing. Like, this proof extremely strongly used the fact that uh, they are actually Gaussian, uh, they are actually, like, the, the random variables are actually Gaussian distributed as a Gaussian. Now, I told you before that concentration inequalities are basically all about moments. So what you could hope for is that, in fact, if I look, if I have a Lipschitz functions of a sub-Gaussian random variables, so if each of my uh, variables is concentrated just as well as a Gaussian, then maybe applying this uh, Lipschitz functions will give me again a sub-Gaussian random variable. And the surprising thing is that it is not true. And it is like, worth remembering it. Uh, let's see a kind of example. So th this is like, I don't know, people don't always talk about those kind of examples. Like it, you, we, they always talk that you need extra assumptions uh, if, if your variables are not Gaussians, but I never knew why, why this is true. Uh, so one kind of uh, sub-Gaussian random variable that's not uh, Gaussian is just the like independent, independent coin. So for each variable xi, I just, uh, each variable xi is just plus minus one with probability half. And now, what is going to be my function f? Uh, I haven't, so this is a distribution on a hypercube, right? It has values plus minus one, so it is on the corners of a hypercube. I'm going to look at all the points on this hypercube such that the sum of the coordinates is smaller than zero. So kind of those points. But I'm going to look only at the points on the hypercube. So this discrete set. And my function is just the distance, my function f is just the distance to this discrete set. So for any point, uh, for any, any point inside, I'm looking at what is the closest point in this discrete set, and I'm asking what is the L2 distance here. And it is easy to, like by triangle inequality, this is one Lipschitz. So for any set A, the distance to this set A is a uh, one Lipschitz function. Uh, we want to show that this function is actually not concentrated around its expectation or media or whatnot. So, uh, by the way, um, uh, yes, so like whenever I have a random variable, I can, uh, like I, I was talking about concentration and its expectation. Now it's going to be nice, a little bit more uh, useful to talk about concentration around median. So median is uh, just the value such that median of x is just uh, sorry, is just a value lambda such that probability that x is greater than lambda is equal to half. So if I have a you know a distribution, then the median is the, the value such that this mass integrates to exactly half. And now if my random variables, random variable is say one sub Gaussian around its expectation, then most of the mass is within a constant to like within you know ten from the expectation. So median and the the, the average and the expectations are actually close to each other. So uh, 
whenever I have a concentration around the mean, like sub Gaussian kind of concentration around the mean, I have the same kind of sub Gaussian concentration around the media. So, what I will show is that with uh, actually uh, quite a decent probability, so uh, median of this f is uh, just zero, right? Like with probability half, if I look at the random coins AI, then with probability half, uh, sum of all, all the AIs is going to be zero. So I know that whatever is my, whatever is the distribution of this, uh, of this random variable f of x, with probability half it's zero, and with some remaining probability it's somehow distributed. So the, the median of this variable is zero, and what I will show is that actually with quite a decent probability, say one quarter, the value of f is going to be much larger than, than cube root of n. Uh, not cube, fold root of n. Uh, okay, so why is that? Uh, what is the what is the squared distance of my favorite point X to the closest point in A? If I if I drew a point X which looks like one one one. 1, minus 1, minus 1, minus 1. And maybe I have more 1s than, than minus 1s. Uh, so I have, a, you know, A1s and B minus 1s. And I want to find a closest point on the hypercube where the number of minus 1s is at least the number of 1s. So there is only one thing I could do. I, could, I have to choose, you know, whatever is the correct number of things here and flip them to minus one. Uh, if, so if I do this, I know that the distance of my point, uh, square distance of my point to this set A is just the sum of all the coordinates. So this is like how many coordinates I have to flip so that this whole thing becomes, uh, the sum becomes zero. Uh, Okay, but uh, uh, okay, but uh, this is stupid. This is, shouldn't be one over square root n. Now, what can I say about the variable sum of x i? Sum of x i is a random variable with standard deviation square root n. And it's actually not too difficult to show that uh, it has a constant probability of being at least some fraction of a standard deviation away from the, its expectation. There's this thing called pali zygmunt inequality. So really I should expect that if I look at a bunch of random coins, then some of those random coins with a constant probability is at least, uh, at least square root n over 10 or something. I know by Chebyshev inequality that it's at most 10 times square root n, but really with a, with a decent probability, it's at least square root n as well. So with probability, you know, half this entire uh, sum is larger than zero. If it's larger than zero, then with probability, again, quarter or something, this entire sum is actually as large. This entire sum is actually as large as square root n. So f of x squared is as large as square root n. So f of x with probability quarter is as large as the fold root of n. So the, like, the bottom line is that this entire thing is not, uh, uh, is not at all con as, as well concentrated as we would like it to be for a, uh, for a uh, for application of a one Lipschitz function on a one, one Gaussian random variables. Okay, but things like that, like, so we can save it. Uh, there are general theorems that say that if I look at a, if I look at a function of a independent uh, banded random variables, I can again get a strong sub-Gaussian kind of concentration. 
So I'm going to uh, define a function. Uh, like I'm going to say that the function f is convex, even only if, I, I guess you've seen this, 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 this definition again, even only if, Whenever I have, uh, so what is a convex function? X squared is a convex function. Fun function is convex, even only if whenever I choose two points, A and B, this entire, uh, this entire line is above the plot, the, the graph of the function. Uh, and the theorem says that whenever I have any independent bounded random variables, and uh, I, I apply a Lipschitz convex function to those random, uh, to those random, random variables. Then, in, then again, the, this function is uh, one sub Gaussian around its expectation, or L sub Gaussian around its expectation. I'm not going to prove this theorem, but it is useful theorem to, to, to have in your back of tools. And again, example, the same one. Uh, we have shown by this Lipschitz concentration of Gaussian functions that a norm of a random matrix with a Gaussian entries is one sub Gaussian. If we chose, a, if we looked at the matrix with bounded entries, we chose that the, we, we showed that the variance of a norm is at most one, but we didn't say anything about strong concentration. Like we get all, from this variance, we can get only one over lambda, like Chebyshev kind of concentration. So, so the, from this theorem, we can actually deduce that uh, since norm, uh, norms, like whatever norm is, it, just by triangle inequality, every norm is convex function. Then, uh, and we already showed that the, the, like the, the L2, like the spectral norm is li one Lipschitz with respect to the entries. Then, in fact, the <clears throat> Whenever I have a matrix A with independent entries that say plus minus one, the spectral norm of this matrix is bounded, uh, is uh, concentrated around its expectation on a scale one. And it's again a sub Gaussian kind of concentration. Uh, okay, one more theorem. That is uh, useful to, I'm, I'm not going to prove this, and I think I'm not going to prove this either. Uh, so let's revisit those bounded difference functions. I said that f is bounded difference if whenever I just vary a single coordinate, the, uh, whenever I just vary a single coordinate, the, the function doesn't change by more than ai. And what we have seen is that by f and Stein inequality, uh, if I apply this bounded difference function to independent random variables, I'm going to get a random variable with a standard deviation that's L2 norm of the vector A. I claim that something stronger is actually true. Whenever I have any function with this bounded difference property, uh, then, and I apply it to independent random variable, then in fact, this F is concentrated around its expectation on a, has sub Gaussian concentration on this uh, and its expectation on a scale uh, that's just norm of A. That's you know proportional to this thing that we we we, we used to upper bound uh, standard standard deviation by. Uh, uh, so th this this is a, yeah this is basically like. A spe uh, more general statement of this having inequality. If we look at the sum of independent random variables, each of them are bounded, then this sum is uh, concentrated around the, the expectation. Here I'm saying that I don't need a, a sum. Whenever I have any function that has this bounded difference properties, I will have a sub Gaussian concentration. And uh, yes, we've seen that this specific theorem is not useful for a spectral norm of a mat random matrix, but I can show. A cool example uh, that's the first new example uh, in this talk. So 
Here is a very complicated function to think of. Imagine that I have two sequences of bit, bits. So I flip a, a random coin for each uh, xi, and independently I flip a random co coin for, for each yi. And I'm asking what is the length of the longest common subsequence. So this is like some weird combinatorial uh, function. It's like, you know, to actually algorithmically compute this longest common subsequence, you need some dynamic programming. This is like not not too simple function to, to work with. And in fact, uh, just understanding what is this expectation of this longest common subsequence is quite a difficult task. There are, uh, there's a number of people showing that this, in expectation, this, this longest common sub subsequence between two random strings of bits is of like constant fraction of the, the length of the strings, and this fraction is not understood exactly, but it is somewhere in some sort of range. So proving anything like this is actually uh, kind of fancy. Uh, but what I want to say is that with this, with this theorem that uh, bounded difference function are concentrated around its expectation, we can easily deduce that whatever is the expectation of this longest common subsequence, actually uh, the, 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 the longest common subsequence itself is extremely strongly concentrated around this expectation. And the reason is for this is very simple. If I only flip a single variable here, I'm, I can change the length of the longest common, common subsequence by at most one. I just change the, check this property. I see that this, my function f is a bounded difference function. I can deduce readily from this theorem that uh, the longest common subsequence is square root and sub Gaussian around its expectation. So again, uh, the expectation of it is as large as n, but I have an extremely strong concentration around this expectation on a scale square root n. Uh, yeah, and I guess this is it. This was just like a showcase of a number of cool inequalities. Any questions? Okay, thank you.